International Space Law Advisor at the Secure World Foundation. I also teach International Space Law at Georgetown. Uh, at Secure World, you know, what we have traditionally done as an NGO is focused on peaceful, sustainable uses of space closer to Earth, low Earth orbit, behavior activities at low Earth orbit, into uh, geosynchronous orbit. It is only in the past few years that our attention and concern has expanded higher and broader, and, it, and that is driven by the things that we see happening and the ambitions and the plans that we see happening uh, at the moon. Whether it is scientific activities and ambitions, whether it is national space agencies, uh, exploration plans or scientific plans, uh, whether it is even, you know, not just civil, but military interests and concerns on the moon, in addition to private sector activities and ambitions on the moon. And in fact, when, we, when you put all of those things together, when you start to think about what people want to do on the moon, all those concerns that we had for elsewhere in space, now that they are now uh, also concerning us when we look at lunar activities and lunar plans and, and, and what people want to do on the moon, nation states, et cetera. In fact, the window for normative rulemaking and discussions has now really opened in a serious fashion for lunar activities in a way that maybe 10 or 15 years ago was still beyond the horizon. So I think the time now is actually uh, when we need to be having these serious, pragmatic discussions on setting rules for behavior on the moon in a way that doesn't create uh, tension or is escalatory or is rivalrous. It's very difficult to have those discussions. And in fact, the rules and norms that we set for the moon will carry on elsewhere to other celestial bodies and elsewhere in the solar system. Space law traditionally has concerned, you know, low Earth orbit, uh, geosynchronous orbit. Uh, this is where we see the bulk of activity. Now, finally, we're talking about rules on a celestial body. That's the interesting thing. And the rules that we set, uh, especially now and in the future, will lead us elsewhere in the solar system, dealing with asteroids, uh, dealing with uh, how we behave on Mars. So it's difficult stuff, thankfully, we have an excellent panel of real experts and practitioners and stakeholders to start these discussions and show what the stakes are. So on my immediate right is Dr. Phil Metzger. Dr. Metzger is a planetary scientist with the Florida State Institute at the University of Central Florida, performing research and technology development related to asteroid, lunar, and Martian regolith, including soil mechanics, space weathering, mining, beneficiation, benefaction? What is that? Beneficiation? Either. Either. Uh, uh, construction and rocket exhaust interactions with Relith. In 2021, congratulations, the International Astronomical Union named asteroid 36329 after you. Very cool. Uh, thank you so much for coming, Phil. To uh, Phil's right, well, on, from my perspective, <laughs> on the other side of me <laughs> is Laura Delgado-Lopez. Uh, she is the Senior Poli Policy Analyst at the NASA, NASA Office of Technology, Policy, and Strategy, OTPS at NASA Headquarters. She is, quote unquote, on detail from the policy branch of the NASA, NASA Science Mission Director at the SMD. La Laura is also the former editor-in-chief of Elsevier's Space Policy Journal, which, by the way, is the premier peer-reviewed publication for the interdisciplinary study of space policy. Laura, good to see you. Oh, we moved you. I introduced you first. Just to keep you on your toes. Let's take a step back. <laughs> Between Laura and <laughs> Phil, it's Angelique. <laughs> Angelique is uh, from the Strategy and Innovation Office with the Director of Human and Robotic Exploration at the European Space Agency. She is part of ESA's Moon Strategy and the LEO Strategy teams, the Space Resource Steering Team, and the Moonlight Commercialization Team. She is also part of ESA's newly established Solaris team for assessing the business case for space solar power contributing to European net zero and energy security goals. Angelique, good to see you and thank you for uh, joining us today. On the other side of Laura is uh, Nelly down there. Is the she is the business line manager at Surrey Space Technology Limited, SSTL, where her main focus has been on the realization of SSTL's ambitions in lunar commercialization and navigation services. She's now developing SSTL Lunar, a brand of SSTL dedicated to the provision of lunar support services, looking at offering commercial lunar data relay service provision 
with the Lunar Pathfinder. Nelly, thank you so much for joining us today. And finally, at the end, you have you have Landsman, who worked in the Israeli space industry as a systems and operations engineer and was the deputy mission director of the Beersheet Lunar Lander, the only privately funded spacecraft to reach the lunar surface. He's also founder and CEO of Moonscape. Moonscape's goal is to provide remote sensing services from low Earth orbit. So we have the scientific academic community. Beyond that, we have space agencies to talk about their lunar ambitions and plans. And finally, the other um, very important stakeholder is the private industry. I'll first start with Dr. Metzger, and I want to ask if you can give our audience kind of a survey of lunar ambitions, lunar goals, some of the scientific lunar ambitions and goals, but also some of the other activities that we'd like to do on the moon, including private activities. Sure. So um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I totally agree with you that now is the time we need to start working on policy because there's so much that is going to start happening on the moon over the next decade, two decades. Um, first of all, scientifically, the, we, th there's this idea that we, uh, if we've been to the moon, why do we need to go back? Well, when we went to the moon last time, we learned enough to create a lot of really important questions, and so now we need to go back to answer those questions. Um, we have some beginnings of a theory on how the moon formed. We think a planet that was we call Thea impacted the Earth um, and formed a toroid of super hot geomaterial, which eventually coalesced into the moon, but the physics of that process haven't been worked out. By doing field geology on the surface, getting samples with the remnants magnetism, we can learn about the core processes in the moon and help to constrain those models. So that's our history. You know, the moon is really crucial for the environment of the Earth, and there is a lot of thinking that advanced life depends on the moon um, to stabilize our axial tilt, for example. And it's a unique moon. I mean, our moon is, compared to other planets in the solar yes. system, we have a huge moon. Yeah, it's basically a double planet system. Um, and uh, I mean, we call it a planet. It's uh, it's one of the terrestrial planets, and um, for the size of the moon compared to the size of the primary, it's unique from everything we've seen. Mm. Um, but so the understanding the moon is part about understanding our own history, how we're able to live here. But more than that, the moon is also contains a record of the solar system's history. Here on the Earth, the the atmosphere and the water. Um, weathers the data and ruins the old data, and the plate tectonics recycle the surface materials, but the moon has retained a history over its entire lifespan in the, in the soil. And um, so if we can put field geologists on the surface of the moon to mm. study the geochemistry, to study the chemistry of the ice in the poles of the moon, to study the impact layering history, to unravel it, um, for one thing, we might be able to figure out what happened 3.2 billion years ago when we think the solar system was disrupted, which sent lots of comets crashing into the Earth, which brought the water and the carbon that formed us. And so by studying the moon, we can help to answer the question, like, how prevalent is life in the cosmos, and are we alone? So some of the biggest questions are going to be answered when we get back to the moon. But to, to do that science, to make it affordable, we need exploration systems, we need to learn to work with the resources of the moon. We need to develop those technologies to mature them in the environment where they're operating. Um, and I think we need boots on the ground to make that fast and effective. And then those same technologies that use the resources create business opportunities. And I think there is right now a business case for mining the water on the moon to create rocket fuel. I've been working on those technologies. A lot of my colleagues are working on them. And we've all been doing economic studies, and the business case closes. So I think um, it, it may take a few years to mature the technologies, but um, according to the best economic models, water launched off the moon can outcompete water launched off the Earth all the way down to low Earth orbit within a few years, within maybe 10 years. And, and that's going to revolutionize the economics of space transportation, and doing everything in space. Excellent. You know, folks with um, like law policy backgrounds hopefully are already thinking of like the implications of what you've said. Like the, the scientific, you know, ambitions and, and, and interesting opportunities, but we're already starting to see, you know, some of the, the governance challenges. 
I now want to go to uh, Issa. I want to talk to Angeliki. Angeliki, if, if you can kind of give us an overview of uh, European plans and ambitions on the move. Of course. First of all, uh, thank you, Grace Secure World Foundation and the UK Space Agency for hosting this amazing conference and important conversation today. Um, at least is a very dynamic and interesting uh, period for uh, human exploration, human and robotic exploration. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, Europe is already part of uh, NASA's Artemis plans by contributing the service module to the Orion, uh, but also providing um, refueling and habitation modules and enhanced communications for the gateway. Uh, however, uh, still our exploration program is, let's say, uh, one of the smallest and optional programs we have uh, at ESA. Like, there is a lot of emphasis for uh, uh, Earth observation and science missions, uh, but we are lucky because we have a very bold and uh, new ESA director who is mm. trying to raise uh, the European ambition for an investment also for human and robotic uh, exploration. So. Now we are in this process of uh, defining a new exploration program, and we have the ESA Ministerial Council that's coming up in uh, November. Um, we call it the Terra Nova program, which is going to have these three destinations, low Earth orbit, moon, Mars. And we are um, the major element, let's say, we try to propose there is uh, a European large uh, logistics uh, lander, so we have like a autonomous capabilities to access the lunar surface. Um, this could provide up to 1.5 tons of uh, science and technologies to the lunar surface. But we are also starting to, um, to study other potential elements that we could contribute to Artemis surface operations from uh, habitation modules to an ISRU pilot plan. We have a- ISRU? Yes, okay. we have a space resource strategy, also the European Space Resource Innovation Center in collaboration with uh, Luxembourg. We have a different uh, emphasis more on oxygen extraction than uh, ice water than that NASA is focusing more. Um, and uh, we also study uh, a new constellation for lunar comms and navigation. Um, we are exploring potentially um, a power surface uh, station on the moon, uh, also power beaming and space solar power for uh, lunar surface mm. operations. Um, and finally, we have like a constantly open uh, call for commercial partnerships. Uh, we have uh, uh, the lunar pathfinder that we uh, they will also uh, speak about. And uh, yeah, it's. Um, it's a very dynamic period and we need to see at the ministerial uh, what uh, uh, important decisions will be taken because uh, it can impact you know, what Europe is going to be doing on the moon and beyond up to 2040. So um, uh, we hope that uh, the member states will also follow the DJ's ambition. <laughs> okay, and uh, hold on, it's, not, it's scientific investigations and exploration of the moon, but there's also like a commercialization and development, industrial development. Yes, we have uh, an ESA lunar science strategy, we have uh, the space resources strategy, which is a separate document, mm. and then we have a commercialization department that has uh, uh, a constantly open call for commercial partnerships, so various startups can come to us and ask for support to, to mature their business uh, model and uh, find flight opportunities or other resources they might need. And so ESA does want to use resources on the moon? <laughs> yes, we have a space resource strategy that has been endorsed by uh, the ESA Council, and uh, as I said before, we we have uh, an annual space resources week we organize with the Luxembourg Space Agency. Mm -hmm. We are a partner at the European Space Resources uh, uh, Center that is based in Luxembourg, where we are actually now studying about creating a ground. Um, let's say a ground uh, model for ICRU extraction, we do like a ground uh, modeling intensely. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now let's talk about what NASA's plans and ambitions are. So, Laura, the sure. floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, uh, Secure World and the UK Space Agency for the invitation. And Juliki mentioned Artemis, and actually that's a great segue to Phil's comments because <laughs> Artemis is really the focal point of a whole diverse set of activities that will um, achieve something historic, which is landing the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And uh, that will, you know, everything we learn in that process in the series of, you know, increasingly complex missions that will get us there, uh, we will use to propel the next giant leap, which is humans on Mars. And so this is a vision of really kind of, like I said, increasingly complex uh, towards sustainable exploration. Um, Artemis 1 will involve uh, uncrewed, test of the space launch system rocket, as well as the Orion capsule. We're hoping to do that uh, late August or early September. Um, date will be confirmed soon. And then after that, we will have um, a crewed orbital mission around the moon uh, to, to you know, return humans to the lunar orbit for the first time since 1972. And then um, eventually we'll have those boots on the lunar surface um, in 2025. And so, you know, that there's a lot of activity, as, as you know, trying to get us there and make that successful. But um, if you're antsy for other developments, um, the, some of the robotic activities that, that we've been alluding to are, are also happening very soon. This year we're going to have the first two deliveries under our commercial lunar payload services, which is a really interesting program. It's uh, competitively selected and it involves you know, leveraging this growing commercial market of, of U.S. companies that are able to deliver payloads to the moon. And that includes NASA payloads to, you know, do research, test some technologies, but also from other customers, other space agencies, private sector. Um, in fact, the Lunar Pathfinder that we've been talking about um, is, uh, is going to be delivered through a, a CLIPS uh, provider, which is pretty exciting. Um, Viper is another one, you know, uh, we just talked about volatiles and water ice, so Viper is going to be a... Uh, rover that's going to help characterize some of those volatiles in the lunar surface um, and help us, you know, get us on that path for in situ resource utilization that we've been talking about. So when you think about NASA's lunar exploration plans, it's really trying to take advantage of all this diverse, very complex kind of picture of activities to use that all and, and leverage all of that so that we do get to that goal of sustainable exploration. It's not no longer about getting there first and leaving. It's about really building, you know, for commercial success and for the success of our partners. That's why we're not going alone, right? Um, ESA, the UK, um, and other countries are, are really critical partners in that. And it's not just, again, not just exploration, but it is like fostering economic, uh, you know, f f uh, industrial development of the moon. Yes, I think, um, and actually NASA just issued a report about a week ago on the commercial competitiveness and, and, and some of the um, opportunities we see in that space with Artemis. I think the vision is for us to be sustainable, it, it has to enable the success of the private sector, right? And so that's where the governance questions come in, of course, but that's why we're trying to be really intentional and taking more risks in how we work with the private sector, not just the, the traditional contracts, but also things like CLIPS. Mm -hmm. um, because, because it is going to have us be, I think, um, more creative in our relationship with the private sector so that they can take risks and, you know, we can sort of figure it out together. Great. Now, before I go to the private sector, uh, I want to hear again from uh, the uh, government agencies. Um, what governance gaps do you see in, you know, developing uh, in all these visions and goals that you have? What governance gaps and, and how do you think NASA and ESA are working to solve them? Um, let's see. Um, in terms of moonlight, I believe we have like quite clear um, guidance, and uh, for example, like there is frequency coordination. Like the problem we mainly have is like what kind of standards. There are like various different types of standards that uh, commercial lunar comms and navigations could be uh, using. Um, obviously, in terms of uh, space resources, now we have at the, the UN level a new uh, international working group that for the next five years is going to be debating the various uh, legal aspects and governance issues around space resources, which I believe is going to be like a very long and complicated uh, debate. Um, and then, uh, yeah, obviously with uh, the human missions, it's going to be a totally new 
uh, territory. So um, uh, I believe uh, with every mission we might be discovering new, uh, new issues we need to, to consider. Mm -hmm. And to build on that, I think for us, one of the things we're starting to think about is, you know, with all of these actors, again, the vision is commercial, international, you know, NASA and other space agencies. Um, there's only so much room on the moon, right? And if we're all, for example, trying to get to the lunar south pole, um, there, there, there's actual physical and technical constraints to where we can land and operate, for example, to do some of the research that a lot of us in the room are interested in. And so. When you think about that, then when you make decisions about where you go and how you go, then there is a need to coordinate, share information, and perhaps have a consideration of these other principles like transparency and you know um, trying not to interfere with each other, so that we don't inadvertently cut off you know opportunities for other actors that may come after us, right? And so that's actually one of the studies my my office, the Office of Technology Policy and Strategy at NASA, newly established last November. Um, we have a study going on looking at particularly that question of the lunar landing sites because trying to balance the technical, the policy considerations, and and you know trying to go through that exercise of okay, how will we go about that? What are the constraints? And then. I think the ambition is being transparent about those choices and those constraints will help set some of those precedents that I think will be necessary for other other locations in the solar system as well. You mean like internationally transparent? Like you would you would let the Copus and elsewhere know where you want to go on the moon? I think so. Yes, I you know I don't have the specific answer of where we would go that, but that's mm. definitely part of the vision. You know, how would we share that information and in what timeline as well, so that other actors were planning to go to the same location, you know, mm -hmm. how do we then coordinate? So we're, we're starting to think about those, those questions, because again, I think everyone in the room is in agreement, we want to be um, not getting each other's way, but so we got to think about what does that mean when we're actually trying to occupy the same lunar space. Mm. And not just with your industrial partners, but with other nations that you're not partners. Exactly. Exactly. And to build upon that, of course, there are like locations on the moon that are more scarce or for more uh, geopolitical or scientific interests, like the South Pole or like uh, mm -hmm. the peaks of eternal light. And also, apart from these locations that are specific and few, um, the corridors and like the pathways you might need to take with a rover mm. to, to okay. get there, you know, it might be very specific. So. Uh, it's also... We know, may need a stoplight, you know? And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my, my, personal opinion, <laughs> my personal opinion is, you mentioned the peaks of eternal light. Those are the, the hilltops near the poles of the moon, which have nearly perpetual sunlight during the month. Um, those are areas of high energy. They're right close to the ice, which is a super valuable resource. It's almost completely out of Earth's gravity well, so that the resources are available to do anything in space. So in my opinion, those peaks of eternal light are the most valuable real estate in the whole solar system, and they're limited. So there's a policy issue. Noted. Right. So before we get to that uh, and talking about that, I will now want to turn to commercial sector. Nelly, I want to speak with you. I want to hear a little bit about uh, the Moonlight program and um, whether there's sufficient clarity or guidance in the regulation for it. But first, please tell us about it. Sure. Um, thank you very much for having me on this panel. And thank you to ESA and NASA for introducing Lunar Pathfinder. Job done. Perfect. <laughs> I can go. Um, no, so it's, it's a very in exciting time uh, for, for the commercial sector that is um, envisaging um, developing the lunar activity, and especially for SSTL. Uh, which is developing an ECTL lunar activity that we have been targeting and working with UKSA, working with ESA, and then working with NASA now for a number of years. Um, so our goal is to provide an infrastructure that's going to provide communication and navigation services as um, a local infrastructure on, around the moon. So we're talking about one satellite for Lunar Pathfinder, but then we're involved in the ESA Moonlight Program, which is a constellation of satellites around the moon to provide communication and navigation services to lunar missions. Um, so we are pioneering here an aspect of the lunar economy and very excitingly an aspect of the space for space because we're not talking about 
uh, rendering a service for an asset or an element that is on, on, on space for us, but a service that's in space for space, and that's a very exciting aspect to look at. Um, so I mentioned in you know, a Pathfinder, it's a single data relay satellite that's going to be launched through the NASA CLIPS program, um, and uh, it will be followed by the ESA Moonlight uh, constellation, which we are uh, working with ESA on the phase AB1 right now, and then, and then we'll see, Angeliki is right, the ministerial um, will be a, a very uh, significant outcome for how this Moonlight program is going to it's going to progress, so we are all very, very interested in, in the outcome. Now, on your question on the, on the regulation, I think, um, yes, it does permit. So, um, if I start with Lunar Pathfinder, it's fairly simple. What we need to do is, is transmit and emit on two uh, links, the Earth's link between the Earth and the data relay satellite, and then the moon link between the data relay satellite and the uh, lunar mission. That is a question of, uh, of uh, spectrum and frequency. So there is a lot of work that is being done on the private sector, but also with ESA and NASA to make sure that we are filing it properly. But I think that we know pretty much how to do it and how to get the, the right uh, regulation. Now there was a question of, of fostering and protecting um, the activities, and I think that's much much less clear, um, because for us, we're developing a support service. Or so, uh, yeah, it, it services in support of lunar exploration. So it means that the missions that we are supporting have to be themselves sustainable, reliable, and they need to come back. There is no point in investing a large amount of money in developing a sustainable infrastructure around the moon if the, the the first commerce to the moon are going to be discouraged because they can't do anything with their research or, or because it's too complicated or because there is no regulation at all and they don't know how to develop their business case. In addition, we have business cases that we need to present to investors, mm -hmm. so we need to have a certain level of certainty. So perhaps is the answer mm. to foster mm -hmm. and protect. Okay, excellent. Uh, you have same questions to you. Please tell us. So. Can you repeat the question, please? So, <laughs> um, you know, what are your, uh, your company's plans for what you want to do on the moon? And is there sufficient regulation to give you clarity and protection against other actors? Well, um, what Moonscape is about um, is remote sensing, mostly observation uh, for, the lunar, um, for the lunar surface. Um, which, in contrary to, to regular observation missions for, for the moon so far, which were uh, for purposes of science and exploration, this is for mostly for the benefit of the other lunar missions, because there's going to be so many of those, and they need some support. Uh, in my previous mission, the Bereshit mission, uh, I, uh, I already saw that we don't have a clear um, information about what we're going to land on. Um, the, the average resolution of uh, images from uh, the moon is about 10 meters per pixel, right? And uh, in, in very uh, few sites, we, we have better than that. But we can do much better because 10 meters per pixel is not practical for the use of, uh, of lenders, of lending uh, companies, um, because uh, most of the landers are much smaller than, than uh, this uh, pixel. Uh, so you actually don't know what you're going to land uh, on top of. And um, even though everyone is uh, developing um, smart algorithms uh, of uh, hazard detection and avoidance, think about how you teach those algorithms, how you uh, uh, test them. You can't actually because you don't have the proper data. Uh, about what's uh, what's down there, and uh, I think that uh, it's it's uh, something that uh, uh, we can provide uh, stature re resolution of uh, 10 to 20 centimeters per pixel, which will be revolutionary for for that cause. But also, it can be used for other things like situational awareness, monitoring, uh, prospecting if it's uh, hyperspectral uh, uh, payloads. Uh, and also to, to tackle all kinds of uh, legal issues, legal disputes maybe that, that will happen for sure if you 
take into account the density of the emissions on the surface of the moon. We mentioned that before, uh, there's going to be a concentration of uh, a lot of missions in the same places because these are the places we are interested in. Mm -hmm. But also if you imagine uh, a scenario uh, of a starship that lands somewhere uh, on the moon with the capacity that uh, they claim it's, uh, it's 100 metric tons. So even if it's just half of that, um, it, it's a lot of missions. So imagine they deploy the missions around the, the rocket and, and then what? Those missions are not going anywhere. I mean, several of them can be rovers, but we know how slow rovers are. Uh, most of the missions are going to stay in place with a uh, very close proximity of sometimes a few meters from each other. Mm -hmm. So are we ready for that? Um, do, do we understand what it means? In, in most uh, space operations so far, when we operate satellites, we mostly don't care what others are doing. Here we care because it will affect us and we will affect them. If we pick up the best spot of solar panels and we deploy them and everything is beautiful and then our neighbor uh, uh, begin to, uh, to build some construction that uh, casts a shadow over our uh, solar arrays, is it, uh, can, can we sue them? I, I don't know, I, 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 I'm not a lawyer, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that, that might happen. Or, uh, uh, the, even the fact that you don't know who, who your neighbors are. Um, uh, it can be a different country, maybe a rival country, maybe it's your uh, um, a commercial competitor. Uh, it can be um, also uh, some entrepreneurs that want to test their new uh, space uh, uh, moon bike uh, to, to drive around and spread a lot of uh, regolith all around. Who knows, it's possible. Um, I'm not inventing that. It, it was on, a, <laughs> or on some uh, journal. Uh, so this will happen. And uh, this means that we will need a way, um, I, I, like an external eye to, to overlook what's going on, to monitor uh, our very expensive assets there. Um, and uh, on Earth, we have uh, other alternatives we can even send people to look what's going on on the moon. We don't have that privilege. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a different kind of space operations that we need to start realizing that this, uh, this is what's going on. Um, so um, you, you ask about uh, the, the regulations and... Um, yeah, I want to ask, I want to dwell on... Um, governmental oversight, authorization, and supervision. We know the obligations in Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, states are internationally responsible, but they have that duty of authorization con and continuing supervision uh, to ensure continuing compliance with the treaties. Uh, for those folks who uh, aren't aware of Yoav and his history, he has a very unique, possibly uh, historical uh, uh, element when we talk about oversight of lunar activities. Um, this is being broadcast and recorded, but you have, I do want you to maybe explain a little bit about um, the situation which, which is historical for you in terms of a government knowing beforehand what was going to the moon. So you mean the tardigrade something? Yeah. Tell, in, in your own words, you are, in your own words. Um, yeah, funny story. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't that funny at the time. Uh, well, my previous mission was uh, with Space IL, with the Bereshit mission. Uh, we sent the lander uh, to the moon. Um, it was uh, three years ago. Um, and uh, we got to the moon, um, not exactly as we planned. We crashed, um, but, uh, but we got there. And uh, I think about two months after, after the crash, one of our suppliers who supplied the payload of uh, several disk-like uh, objects with uh, laser encryption of uh, a lot of information like the entire Wikipedia and a lot of art uh, uh, and literature and uh, stuff like that. Um, he admitted on Twitter, of all places, that, uh, that um, with the disks were a, a very tiny piece, uh, a, a capsule that contained biological sample of, uh, of DNA of uh, some people and I, I don't want to think what it means and, and tardigrades. 
Uh, tardigrades, if, if you don't know, it's microscopic beings that, that uh, can survive uh, in outer space and in a very harsh uh, environment. So uh, they wanted to send them there to, uh, to, I don't know, to let them be there. <laughs> the problem is that um, when, we, um, we, when we registered uh, um, um, our mission and uh, declare what we carry with us uh, uh, to uh, the United States of America, uh, where we launched uh, our spacecraft, and to the FAA in particular, we needed to declare exactly what's on board. And they asked specific question about biological uh, payloads. And we, of course, said that, no, we don't have any biological material on board. And then uh, this, um, this thing exploded <laughs> uh, in our face, uh, literally. Um, it, we uh, uh, got a call from the FAA. Uh, they wanted answers and, uh, well, th this is where the lawyers start to work on all sides. Um, we um, didn't know anything about that. Uh, he actually admitted that he never told anyone that uh, that, that was uh, on board. Uh, so actually we can say that it's allegedly on board. We, we didn't, uh, we, we can't even prove that it, it was there. Um, but we declared that it's not. So uh, that, that, is, that is the problem. Um, eventually, they, uh, they said that uh, we are cleared of, uh, of uh, guilt, and um, things went uh, uh, back to normal, uh, if you can say so. But uh, it happened, and it means that it can happen again. And uh, it means that we need to be aware that um, in some cases, we might not be fully uh, aware of what we carry with our uh, spacecraft. Mm. Uh, I mean, we, we deal with a lot of suppliers and um, they declare what they, what they give us, but, you know, who knows? Mm. Um, so maybe we should, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's mandatory to, to find a way to, uh, to make sure that uh, we don't carry things that we don't want to carry. Um, it can be something of, uh, of significance. What, what if it's a, it's a dangerous material that we carry to the ISS, for example, or uh, to, to uh, other places? I mean, uh, uh, on the Monday, it, a biological um, uh, payload doesn't have any effect now, mm. but uh, maybe in Let's the future. Let's that. I want to yeah. hear, what, what, how does the scientific reaction to tardigrades on the moon or implications of tardigrades on the moon? Well, there was a lot of outrage, um, but the, the moon is classified as the least concern for planetary protection. I think there's four categories. It's the lowest category, and the only requirement for planetary protection for the moon is that you have to declare what you're taking to the moon. Um, and it would be approved, you know, if they had said we want to take tardigrades, there was no basis to disapprove it but they broke the regulation because they, it, there was no opportunity to review it. So that was the problem. But, but it shouldn't cause any problem. We don't think anything can live on the moon, not even tardigrades. Oh, but there is water on the moon. Is there any chance that they could be rehydrated? Um, no. Well, the water on the moon is like 40 degrees above absolute zero, so it's solid form. Um, and it's only in the polar areas. But if you, um, if you did rehydrate the tardigrades, I don't know if they would survive or not. I'm not a biologist. Interesting. All right. Um, and, and I wanted to raise that issue and that, that, that fact pattern because it really gets to, you know, we, all the people who have ambitions to do things on the moon, uh, element of trust and, you know, b between industrial partners is a component of, of doing things in a sustainable fashion. Uh, and also keeping in mind that whatever a nation state does, it is responsible to other actors. So any reactions from... Um, yeah, actually, I think it creates um, an interesting emerging issue about how we authorize future lunar missions and payloads, especially on the commercial front, because 
Uh, now you have this interesting phenomenon where like, there is a payload inside the rover, which is in, inside the lander that might be carrying like eight other, uh, eight other, other different payloads from commercial and international partners. So like, uh, I believe like, now we are authorizing more like the, you know, uh, the umbrella mission, the lander, while we're not really going into the various different, different levels of uh, payloads that might be included. So, um, yeah, I think like national uh, processes for authorizing these missions might ha start to think about these extra la layers of complexity from now on. Uh, Laura. I want to talk about the same question for you. How how can we um, you know prevent some things like that and be do things in a safe, sustainable, transparent fashion? I think you know Phil mentioned trust. I think that building trust with this community of operators, this very diverse community of operators, um, is a challenge. But that's why it's an imperative, right? And so when you think about things like the Artemis Accords, which we've been hearing a little bit about. Um, that's something that uh, we, NASA, and the U.S. Department of State launched in 2020. It's a way to reinforce the principles um, that we've already signed on to through our space treaty and other foundational um, treaties to carry us into this next stage of exploration, right? So from a state perspective, it's an opportunity to reinforce that and to make a political statement that, yes, we will abide by that. Um, 20 countries have signed on, which is really exciting. Um, but you know, we're thinking about how can we carry those values onto the other actors, right? The, the mm -hmm. elephant in the room, the private sector. And, and I think um, the way we're doing that is we're talking about governance in every single setting. So it's not just about talking about it at the UN, which is of course critical, but when we meet with our industry partners, we talk about that and we talk about the expectations that they do abide by the rules and that they do share that information. Um, because, because we recognize that not just from a strict legal perspective of we're liable, but some, even, even just this case, it could have had co negative consequences to future activities, right? And so, um, you know, we want to do very critical research and science uh, on the moon. We don't want to inadvertently, through, you know, a private sector partner who doesn't disclose something, you know, threaten that research. And so I think, I think that's w the, the way we're perceiving it is, that's why we have to bring them into these conversations from the beginning and, and really set those expectations uh, from, from the get-go. And, and of course, enforce that through, you know, is it licensing, is it contract vehicles, is it, you know, other ways. But, but that, I think it's, it's building that trust and being very firm about this is how we expect you to operate. Mm. And these are the rules we're going to follow as well, mm. which is just as important. So I have a question. It's hypothetical. You guys do not have to answer it. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But I would say someone who has, uh, who appears to have, who we think have uh, smuggled things to the moon, should they be allowed to go back to the moon? Should they be allowed to return with their missions and programs? Or once you've proven that you're not going to be transparent, um, is that an activity that, well, that's it. We're, we're, we're not going to let you back. That's a hypothetical question for my panel and maybe for the folks in the audience. Um, I want to talk about um, the fact that there's some activities we want to do on the moon that once you do them, they may prejudice or interfere with other later activities. So if you want to do space science and learn about formation of the moon, um, but the miners get there first, will your activities be you know, just ruined? Uh, is there, what, what, what's the component of that? How, how do you see that? Yeah, so first of all, um, it's a great question. And um, I, I actually did some research on the relationship of economic activity and scientific progress. And, um, and although there are cases and opportunities for conflict and, and harm, as you've just described, the, the overall relationship I want to emphasize is that they're synergistic the vast majority of geological data that we have about planet Earth came from mining, from petroleum extraction, from economic activity. I mean, overwhelmingly the vast majority of data. And I've looked in the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics and 95% of Earth scientists are working in economic applications, 5% mm. are in academia, being funded by their students who are 95% going into economic activity. 
So it's um, overwhelmingly the more economic activity you do, the more progress you have in science, the more access to data, the more infrastructure, the more development that provides the tools the scientist needs, and, and there have been papers showing the correlation. So if we manage it appropriately, it can be a win-win situation, but we do need to worry about the cases where they can conflict. Um, for example, the ice in the poles of the moon mm -hmm. is really super valuable scientifically. We want to understand the chemistry, we want to understand from what part of the solar system did it come and when. Um, but we don't want a whole bunch of rockets blowing rocket exhaust in there, freezing in mixing with the ice to mess up the chemistry. Now maybe that won't happen, but we need to be careful to think about it to make sure it doesn't happen. So that's an example where we need to be careful about it. Um, one thing we might consider doing is putting a requirement on economic activities that they provide data back to the scientific communities of the world um, in order to be compliant with the Outer Space Treaty. So that the activity, that could be a component of um, making your activity be for the common good of humanity. Mm. So um, if all of the mining companies were required to provide samples and chemistry and geochemistry of, of that they're accessing, it could be a real boon to science. Yeah, and I'll add that another principle that we emphasize in the Artemis Accords is this idea of sharing scientific information and data, right? And that ties into making sure that the benefits of space get to, you know, the, the benefit the world, right? And so I think when we drill those samples and, and you know, we have to make sure that we're sharing that information with the, with the, across the science community so that everybody doesn't have to take their own seashell when they go to the beach, right? And so um, I think that it paired with that coordination for resources that are gonna be a lot harder to share will hopefully minimize some of those negative consequences. I'd like to mention one statistic. We visit a small body in the solar system on average once every two years. And at that rate, we're gonna visit them all within about 10 million years all the ones over a certain size. So it's not like we're going to run out of small bodies um, by mining them. But if we do mine them, we will have vastly more access to the data. Mm -hmm. The moon is a little bit more of a concern, though, because the moon is, is the only one moon. Just the one. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I want to hear more about um, how we develop rules and specific rules for specific locations. Do you think we need a specific regime for mining on the moon, a specific regime or set of rules for the you know the the poles of the moon or the the far the uh, the far side of the moon, in order to protect and really balance the activities that are happening there. I mean, how do you see this normative framework development? Uh, I, I like, tough that. question, I know. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure if we need the specific regime, but maybe we have like a more uh, near-term coordination issue. For example. We have all these upcoming uh, CLIPS missions, but also international landers that are going to the moon next year even. Uh, and then potentially we might have larger landers like uh, Starship, <laughs> adding you know, hundreds of tons uh, to the surface. So I was wondering if uh, as a first step, maybe the science community would have to come together, international science community, and maybe coordinate some landing sites or locations that we, we, you know, we steer all international commercial missions towards there, so we kind of minimize the impact on the lunar environment for pot from potential um, dust plumes, or even uh, you know start thinking about how we could create like landing pads and like feel that <laughs> we'll have more to to add there. But like uh, yeah, I believe some kind of coordination around like landing areas might be uh, needed urgently. <laughs> Okay, good. Actually, Phil, that does tee you up for a question about lunar dust and landing pads. Please, actually, we, we, you may need to explain the issue and the problem. But. Okay, um, yeah, so um, I was tweeting about it a few days ago, and so here's a humorous way to look at it. In the movies, in like the Hollywood movies, whenever there's a big giant explosion, they always have the actor walking away from it with the big explosion right behind them and they never flinch, you know, they're so cool, they don't even have to look at it. <laughs> and the reason they can do that is because they know that if you're a couple hundred meters away, you're safe. 
well, why is that? Well, because we have an atmosphere, and the atmosphere provides drag so that the particles stop, and they don't go more than a couple hundred meters. But the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So when you land on the moon, you're sort of creating a continuous explosion, you're providing high energy hot gases, which are going to accelerate ejecta. And the ejecta is going to get up to the speed of the gas, and then it'll never slow down. And um, the finest particles will get up to the speed of the rocket exhaust. Now, for the Apollo Lunar Module, that was 3,100 meters per second, um, which is about 50% faster, or I don't know, 30% faster than the escape velocity from the moon. Um, the larger particles will go slower, but that means there is no distance on the moon where you're far enough away to have zero probability of getting impacted. There's, n you know, anywhere on the moon is a target. Um, and so, that's, this is for a large lander. Um, and so, we've got to agree, well, how far away is far enough? We're not going to have zero damage. Every time you land on the moon, you're going to have fine particles sandblasting everything else on the moon. Um, so the Outer Space Treaty says, I don't know the exact words, but you're supposed to do no harm. Um, well, we're going to do harm. So we've got to agree on some limit where, OK, so there's going to be harm, but we're going to agree by definition this is no harm. Um, but that's going to take an agreement. And, and it's going to have real consequences, because it determines how close you can land next to other things. Um, and it's going to determine whether you're going to be required to build mitigation techniques like landing pads or berms to block the ejecta. So it's a huge policy issue that has international implications. Yeah. And the idea of uh, um, you know, landing pads being uh, something that is ripe for international collaboration, cooperation, mm -hmm. and peaceful uses and, and like something that would be... Um, a, like a near-term ambitious mm -hmm. but useful goal. You know? Yeah. Actually, there's something called the International Space Exploration Coordination Group where all space agencies that have uh, exploration programs are trying to define the global exploration mm -hmm. roadmap for Moon and Mars. And uh, very recently, uh, it was decided to establish a working group that will be looking into technology knowledge gaps for uh, uh, creating landing pads, so probably uh, next year there might be a report around the landing pads coming out. Um, I want to ask and, and maybe get a little bit political about the conceptions and the ideas, the sentiment that exists out there about uh, you know, um, gold rush and land grab in space and the idea that, that development of the moon could be inequitable or those who get there first get all the best places and the best prizes and those who come later, um, you know, Get what remains. Uh, are you worried about that, and is that a real concern? And if it is, then uh, how do we how do we avoid that and not um, repeat some mistakes that, that we see here on, on Earth in history? Tough one. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that even though we feel that we are in this new era of lunar exploration with uh, all the upcoming missions, we still. It's been more than 50 years since we last landed successfully uh, yeah. on the moon, right? So it's something extremely hard, and still we need a lot of things to go well to, to start having these uh, surface activities that, that we all uh, hope. Uh, so things are kind of still a little bit more slow and uh, scientific, but at the same time, I want to say, uh, to, to say that there are some game-changing parameters in development. So, for example, as I said before, something like Starship would totally change, you know, the, the way we develop uh, uh, payloads or uh, how we do operations or how long we can stay on the surface of the moon. And, like, I feel like uh, we the space and lunar community hasn't really reflected on the potential um, impact it, it would create, right? So, like, if you can suddenly land hundreds of uh, tons on the moon every couple of weeks, um, it, it, yeah, like, what kind of payloads we're going to bring? And, like, um, uh, can you create uh, a moon base from the moment you land, right? 
So, um, yeah, I, I would like to see in the space community more uh, thinking around uh, this game sensing aspect of the gun. I'm casually optimistic that the the urgency that you know we've talked about the last day and a half about sustainability challenges on Earth and around Earth have sort of catalyzed to have those discussions around lunar governance. I think there's enough momentum um, to to do that while we have a little bit of time, right? Um, we, you know, from a U.S. government perspective. We think about it from the sense that, as, as you know, others have mentioned, that the principles we set now are, are going to you know, sustain themselves for a long time. And so we have an obligation to, to get it right. Um, and we want to make sure they're you know, democratic principles and those we share with like-minded nations. And I think that's really important. So even if we, I don't necessarily buy the hype of mm. we're in a race, and I don't think that's necessarily productive discussion when, when, like I said, we're thinking about sustainability, both in the sense of how you do that and the implications, but also sustainability, then we can keep going back. Um, so from that sense, the, the narrative of the race isn't as helpful. Um, but, you know, I'm also not, not trying to look at it with rose-colored eyes. But my hope is that we are having the right conversations today so that as this, this activity start actually materializing and we're not just talking about future plans, um, we can avoid some of, the, some of the, those intractable problems, I think. It seems like the hidden tension is that, on the one hand, actors just want to make it happen and do it and have it be successful because it is so challenging. Yeah. At, at the same time, the, the other issue is that what you do sets a precedent. And, you know, um, other people will be looking for it as, as setting the, the rules of how, how, we, can, how we can behave. Uh, Nelly, you had something to say. Yeah, it's a slightly counterpoint of view, actually. The narrative of the race, I agree overall, is not a very helpful one. But it gets things done. So, you know, thinking from a, from a, a commercial point, point of view, we hear um, I'm representing a company that's in... That's not in scientific research. We are there to provide infrastructure services that enable the scientific research. If we have all the time in the world, and we know that the place is safe and secure, and everybody will have a place, and there is no, no gold rush, no competition, well, then we have time. We don't necessarily need to invest. We don't necessarily need to take risk. And I think a little bit of, hang on, there is a kind of race here, and you need not to be sitting comfortably on your chair, and you need to go and, and get your investors, and you need to go and get risk, take risk, is helpful to, to a certain extent. And, and I think that's a great example of, that's why it's complex, right? Because I'm coming at it, and the regulators are going to come at it with different set of expectations and desires as a private sector, but I want to help make you successful, right? And so we're going to try to come together and balance that. And it's going to be complicated and challenging, right? Yeah. But I think, you know, if, if the narrative is helpful for the private sector, that's great. From a government perspective, we're going to think of equity, for example, and making sure that those two companies that are the first aren't the only ones that make it, right? Mm -hmm. And so hopefully at the end, then, what's actually written down um, in law and regulation, which takes its time, <laughs> um, yeah. It helps helps enable that. Helps you be successful, but keeps the door open so that yeah, you it, know others. It's a balancing can. act, isn't exactly. it? Between, exactly. Between the private sector and and the, the institutions, which what which is why commercial uh, partnerships that we're doing with ESA on the model as well that, that NASA is doing with other uh, private companies is very helpful. We are pushing. We are going for the gold rush, mm -hmm. and we are being managed at the same time. Yeah. Um, you have, do, you, do you resonate with that, the idea that on the one hand, yeah, you, you want to have your commercial company successful, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time, what you do is setting, will be precedent setting, and people will be looking at it. Do you take that into account? Yeah, I, I, I do. And uh, I think as a, well, as a mature person, <laughs> I hope so, I, I, I want to think about uh, the things that I might do for the first time, uh, I, I want to think about them in a, in a most responsible way because this will define how others uh, will uh, act um, and maybe even to, to 
set an example. Um, I want to do things right. Okay, I don't want to interfere with others. I don't want to, to do things in a, uh, in a, um, uh, in, in, in the um, state of mind of uh, um, asking uh, for uh, forgiveness rather than uh, yeah. permission. Um, because I, I think we have a good opportunity uh, to, to actually do something good here um, after we did a lot of wrongs here on earth. Um, so it, it's, it's not just in the, in the legal aspects, it's also about uh, how we do things uh, that, um, uh, with respect to, to other uh, cultures and other uh, nations and other people on the earth that as, as you said before, they, they, they don't have access to, uh, to space resources because they never launched a satellite or anything else uh, to space. Um, I, I think we need to, uh, to think about that and to take that into account. And, and it's our responsibility, even if our uh, business case is pure commercial, we need to be, um, um, to be responsible. Well, do you think that you will be setting precedent, and you will how you how you behave and how you act will be is driven by commercial concerns and being successful and making the mission successful. Yep. Why do you think it should be down to you to determine what behavior should be? Would you not be willing to allow that discussion to happen on a multilateral, international basis, a national basis, and for other people to weigh in and say this is what you want to do, but the world says no. We we think that that's a, not not the best idea. No, I, I, I want to be involved in, so in, uh, in, in such uh, discussions. Uh, I think I am involved in a way, uh, at least in, in some of those. Mm -hmm. you know, I have a limited amount of time. Uh, but uh, but I, I think that, um, that yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm positive that, you, that we can do it. And, and we have a bit of time before we arrive to the moon, right? Um, so uh, I, I think we are in the, um, in, 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 in the we, we, that we can do it right this time. Mm. Nelly, any reactions? I mean, how would you feel if, uh, if um, you know, the United Nations Security Council said, uh, you know, decided that what you want to do on the moon, they, they would not allow it, and, and they decide, not you? I think we'd be very happy to discuss it. Um, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> We, we've been working with with the agencies from the the, the first uh, mm -hmm. concept of what we're doing, and what we've already always said is that we will we will be compliant. So we're designing with compliance in mind. Now it's it's compliant to ESA and NASA's view. So if there was a third body saying, well, no, that doesn't work, it, it wouldn't be a conversation between the SSTL and the UN. That would be a much broader conversation that mm -hmm. I have full trust that because there are a, a vast number of intelligent people that will be talking about the topic that we would get to a resolution that we could make work. So that doesn't scare me. Mm. So uh, in DC, a space policy expert has opined that those who go first set the rules, that the first actor to do something sets the rules for those else uh, later in time. Uh, that, that's a principle maybe of history, but that exists nowhere as a principle of international law. <laughs> and, and I think that the, you know, the reality is there's some truth to that, and which mm -hmm. is why mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not just sitting back and letting things happen. You know, we want, you, we, we want, the US wants to lead and wants to lead with our partners and wants to make sure that these principles that have served us well um, the last 50, 60 years are the ones that we carry forward. So I think I think there's a truth to that, but but not not in the you know I plant the flag and therefore it is mine, right? I don't I don't think that's how that's how anyone should look at it. Certainly. So for our audience, we're still taking questions on the Whova app. You can submit your questions and vote for other questions. I've had a look at them, I've tried to reflect what we, what is in there. Um, but uh, as we look to start to wrapping up our panel, actually we have some time. Uh, I do want to you know ask our panel. Um, you know, a little bit more about um, the, that idea of who's going to be setting precedence on the moon, how, how long that discussion and coordination should last. If you're a regulator, let's say you're a regulator and you get approached 
by one actor who wants to uh, mine on the moon for um, commercial purposes to sell to uh, the governments and, and industry. They, they have a commercial uh, ambition on the moon. At the same time, the scientific community wants to go into the same area and do some scientific investigations. And really, uh, how do you balance those? And let's say that they pretty strongly conflict with each other, that the mining activity will directly affect the scientific in investigations. Uh, who, who gets to go first? <laughs> well, I, my hope is that, you know, that, that company starts with the licensing process and, and all that stuff, right? And that enables some interagency conversations and that enables agencies like NASA to look at the scientific implications and, and all that. And then hopefully that opens the doors to the sort of conversations um, that, that Surrey has been having with its stakeholders. I think it'd be, I think an actor that just tries to go in a very, um, isolated way mm -hmm. is not going to succeed because a lot of what we're talking about um, is in either, it's it's not very clear. Some of these, especially the new ideas that aren't necessarily spelled out in the regulations and the legislation that we have, require that conversation and require people asking questions and, and understanding the implications of those actions. So. Um, I'm not that, like I don't, I don't really see that being approved and then, oh, the science world is ruined, right? Mm. I, I see that that's going to open the door to a lot of discussion and maybe that actor is going to feel like, oh, it's taking too long, but, but that needs to happen. Um, I want to take a step back actually. Phil, how rival, rivalrous are some of these places? It seems like all the interest is Lunar South Pole, Lunar North Pole, maybe some places on the far side. Um, but it, are, are there rivalrous activities and locations all over? Um, well, there's potential for that. I don't think there is yet. Um, I don't, I mean, there are a lot of companies that are looking at doing mining and manufacturing and construction in space. And they're starting to develop the technologies and they've got business models and investors. So it's coming really soon. I, you know, within just years, we're going to be seeing activities that are economic in nature reaching to the lunar surface. Um, but I don't think those kind of conflicts are happening yet because nobody has filed for the mission <laughs> approval where they've stated this is where we're going to go. And I think everybody's keeping their plans um, secret for business mm -hmm. reasons right now. Um, but I know from working in this community for decades that that there's a fear on the business side. Um, the people on the business side, and uh, like me, we really believe that it's for the good of humanity to extend economic activity off the earth, partly so that we can relieve the burden of the earth, and partly so that we can create a greater, more, more um, exciting and beneficial civilization when we're not limited to the planetary scale. And when you look at the broad trajectory of civilization over millennia, and especially since the Industrial Revolution and the Information Revolution, technology is growing and it's accelerating. And so it doesn't take too much extrapolation to realize we will have the technologies, we will have the economic capability within decades to, to have a much bigger and vibrant civilization outside of planet Earth. And, um, and so a lot of people I know on the commercial side are very optimistic. I don't know anybody who isn't. And, and not just optimistic, but they believe that they're doing it for the good of humanity. And they're very much afraid of regulation. They're afraid that, they're, that jealousy or other um, human emotions are going to shut it down and that the whole human species will suffer as a result of not being able to get over this hurdle. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we see that there can be regulation and norm making on a variety of levels. At the, at the international level, it may happen at the United Nations. It may happen at the national level uh, through national regulation or uh, you say how uh, NASA or ESA would implement uh, its activities and programs. Norms may also be set at the lower level between industrial partners or imposed mm -hmm. on uh, commercial actors. And all of those locations are places where norms may be created. 
uh, top down, bottom up, et cetera, et cetera. Really, it will be that idea of polycentricity, of norms and rules and discussions happening, and in fact, competing. So we have discussions which may happen at the United Nations. Uh, we have discussions and some rulemaking which may happen at the uh, lower level, including civil society with the Moon Village Association and their uh, Gegsla group, which I believe you have a couple uh, representatives of, who are looking at um, you know, what we'd like to do on the moon. Uh, I've mentioned the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group and their building blocks, not just for uh, lunar uh, space resources, but space resources uh, elsewhere. So you see that there's these variety of, of norm-making areas. Um, I say all that uh, just to start to look to wrap up our panel and see any final thoughts that, that we would like to hear, although you've already given some broad, sweeping, historical, philosophical final thoughts. Um, but so I'll start actually over at the end with, with Yoav and Nelly. Uh, final thoughts on lunar governance, where to go, uh, and uh, what you'd like to see done, what, what's most pressing. What, what I'd like to see done uh, for me is clarity. I, I think that, that the most important thing, if we want the lunar economy to be a success, is to be able to invest, whether it's on the institutional side, whether it's on the commercial side, mostly done together. Um, and we need clarity. What are we building the business on? Um, are the missions we are going to support capable of sustainability because they have the clarity of what they're going to be able to do as well? So wherever the regulation is done, what I would like is for it to be clear, for it to be um, one voice. We don't want to have to abide by contradictory regulations mm. depending on who we are talking to. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, a bonus enforceable so that we know that we are going to abide by it, but we're not the only one. Everybody is. So I... Um, completely agree with that, but I, I want to add um, that uh, it needs to be very inclusive. We need to talk with everyone. Uh, let's not forget that um, only the Chinese landed on the moon since the 70s, uh, and they, they're doing it greatly. Um, they uh, landed three times, one time on the far side of the moon, which was uh, first, uh, it was the first. Um, and we need to be in discussions with them about what we're going to do um, because we, we cannot just regulate them, for example, um, and we don't expect them to regulate uh, other uh, um, uh, activities. So it needs to be uh, within the same global community. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this is a complementary to what we said. Yeah, and I'll build on that. I, I do think it is a challenge to keep all those different conversations coordinated. And, and that's, you know, that's what keeps me employed, so it's good. But um, I, I think that is the challenge, but it stems from that, that value and that commitment to be inclusive and to, and to uh, recognize that it's not going to be the domain of the few anymore. It can't be. Um, and so I think maintaining that momentum and that openness, that transparency is going to be important. And, and the other kind of theme I'll end on is kind of a parallel to the conversations we've had over the last day and a half and like the, the ASAT panel we had earlier today. Um, there is a difference between intentional activities meant to do harm and meant to interfere and all that. And those, I think, are fortunately the minimum, right? Uh, for the most mm. part, what we talked about today are the unintentional ones where everyone comes at it with the same sort of intentions and objectives, but we recognize that there's limitations that we need to coordinate, right? And so I think that's part of why we're, we're trying to create this coalition of the willing that includes industry, that includes other countries, because I th in, in that strength is where we're gonna find um, the opportunities to, to really stop and reduce the risk of some of the more harmful behavior from really taking hold. You know, I think that's the opportunity to make that the gold standard and be like, that's how we're going to explore moving forward. Mm. Well, what comes to mind is that for the last uh, 15 or so years, like the international exploration roadmaps are being created only by government actors like space agencies. 
uh, or uh, at the you know cell level like we have mainly you know inputs by uh, countries so mm -hmm. there is no clear mechanism yet for uh, the commercial entities to to contribute either to the you know some processes or the space resources working group that has been created now but also on the more technical roadmap aspect uh, you know it's still like something developed by space agencies while we see that there are companies that have more ambitious uh, exploration roadmaps than, than the space uh, space agencies themselves so i wonder you know how we could uh, c create a process to have like a mutually reinforcing uh, roadmap being created and also because between the commercial entities there is always the, uh, the element of competition, how we incentivize them to um, be more open to information sharing and like collaborative so we don't have like duplication of systems. Uh, or uh, yeah, redundant even systems. So like um, yeah, I feel like we need a better way to organize this uh, public and private collaboration overall. Excellent, thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Metzger. Any last words? Yeah, to round out what I said last yes. time. <laughs> <laughs> so there is some fear about mm -hmm. policy being restrictive, but on the other hand, I think most people I work with realize that we need policy because policy creates the well permission for one thing it it creates the legal safe harbor where you can operate it removes risk which makes it more welcoming to investment and so most of the people I know do want policy there is some fear of um, if policy goes astray but um, but we need policy most people I know realize we've got to have it and we're, we're behind the curve we got to get going on this and the other thing I want to emphasized as what Laura said about inclusivity. Um, what I just said a moment ago about this is the trajectory of civilization. If it really happens that we end up with a vastly bigger, more vibrant civilization where most of it is happening off the planet, how are we gonna make sure that all the people of the earth own that? The, the, the economic level for entry is higher than most activities because you need rockets and spaceships and spacesuits. And uh, not every country is a spacefaring country. And not every person in a spacefaring country is in a position to get equity in an aerospace company. So we've got to find ways to create avenues of participation and ownership for the broad swaths of humanity in order to make civilization beyond Earth belong to all of us. There you have it, folks. How about a round of applause for this excellent panel?